history speeds up. Nothing about the industrial technologies the British developed was designed to remain purely British. Just as the previous technologies of the sedentary agriculture, water, wind, and deep water eras diffused outward, so too did the industrial techs of textiles, steam, steel, electricity, and fertilizer. Because much of the work on developing and operationalizing these new techs had already been done, their application in new lands was much faster, which also meant their impacts upon demographic structures were faster. The second major country to experience the mass transformation of industrialization was Germany. In the century leading up to World War I in 1914, Germany rapidly evolved from a shattered, pre-industrial, guild-based economic system, which was often preyed upon by its neighbors, to a united industrial, economic, technological, and military powerhouse that had in shockingly short order defeated Denmark, Austria, and France. The German population, like the British population before it, nearly tripled due to the industrialization and urbanization process. The German population, like the British population before it, aged due to lower mortality rates. The German population, like the British population before it, saw its birth rates plummet. But because the German population, unlike the British population before it, could follow a path blazed by others, the entire process from tip to tail occurred in just four generations. The sheer speed of the German industrialization process, combined with the German geography, contributed to the traumatic horrors of the World Wars. Germans lacked an overseas empire to absorb the surplus populations. Even at its pre-World War I peak, Germany just wasn't that big. A bit smaller than Montana plus Idaho. And half the territory is too rugged to be easily developed. Once industrial techs enabled the German population to expand, Germans quickly discovered they had nowhere to expand into. Part and parcel of why Hitler was so obsessed with munching on the horizon. Throughout the British and German experiences, three additional and completely unrelated issues intensified the urbanization trends that industrialization launched. First was the rise of the women's rights movement. At its core, the women's rights movement didn't really gain traction until the European revolutions of 1848. The technologies of the industrial era spawned massive economic and political upheaval across Europe, culminating in a series of intense civil wars as old political and social structures within and across countries struggled to contain unfamiliar pressures. The new technologies all had one thing in common. They required people, and lots of them. Some of the new techs, like the new assembly lines, required largely unskilled labor. Others, such as petrochemicals, demanded people who really knew what they were doing because, you know, explosions. But for all classes of labor, the new demand drove labor costs up. Culture and ethics and morality aside, whether it was women looking after the farm as the men took factory jobs in town, or the women themselves taking positions at the new industrial textile factories where they could easily earn more than double the income of a strapping lad back on the farm, there was now an economic case for women to be mistresses of their own lives. In traditional societies, women tend to be wed to a very specific physical location, farm and home. If there is a famine or war, it is the men who venture forth to scrounge or battle, while the women remain behind to care for the household. Such restrictions ensured women were typically available. As such, in pre-industrial societies, it was very common for a woman to bear more than six children during the course of her life. But break the link to the household and agriculture. Enable mass female education. Allow women to earn their own income. Even women desiring large families quickly discovered that careers tend to crowd out other items on their to-do list. In part because, regardless of intent, spending a few dozen hours a week at a factory job reduces the opportunities for pregnancy. The second factor encouraging a collapsing birth rate sits at the intersection of women's rights and industrial technologies, birth control. In the days before the Industrial Revolution, the most reliable method of birth control was good timing. 
industrialization expanded the options list. In 1845, the U.S. government awarded a patent for rubber vulcanization to Charles Goodyear. Yes, that Goodyear, which set industry on the path to making cheap, reliable condoms. Combine such advances with the early women's rights movements, and the political and economic stars of the fairer sex began their long rise, but at the cost of overall fertility rates. The third incidental factor, depressing birth rates, can be laid at the feet of the Americans' grand plan for their post-World War II international order. The urbanization trend was already going full steam before the World Wars blasted the old system apart. But with the onset of the free trade order, the world's most advanced economies, most notably Western Europe and Japan, were no longer burdened with a world of constant high-velocity war. Countries could focus on what they did best, or at least what they wanted to do best. And the security placidity of the order enabled them to import food from half a world away. The very nature of the Bretton Woods globalization process depressed birth rates by squeezing the agricultural sector across the industrialized world. In the pre-free trade world, importing food in mass was rarely a viable large-scale option. That drove government calculations both economic and strategic. Cloudy, short summer Germany is hardly known for its rich agricultural system, but in the general melee that was pre-1945 Europe, the Germans had no choice but to wring out as much crappy food from their crappy land as was required for the survival of the state. Ugh, sauerkraut. Great Britain, known for its food only because the food is so bad, was able to take a different road only because the place is an island. By the late 19th century, the imperial system enabled the Brits to source their food from colonies far removed from Europe. Such sourcing options enabled the Brits to not only focus their energies on the manufacturing side of the Industrial Revolution, but also gain the benefits from a globe-spanning empire to boot. The order turned the system inside out. By enforcing global security, shattering the empires, opening the world to trade, and enabling the spread of the agricultural technologies of the Industrial Revolution, the Americans inadvertently introduced the world to global agriculture. Parts of the old imperial networks could now maximize output with an eye towards servicing global demand rather than the narrow needs of the imperial masters. Not only did opportunities increase in a globalized world, so too did scale. More capital flowing to more places triggered transformations in agriculture. Larger farms could be more mechanized, achieving greater efficiencies in output with less and less labor. Such optimization granted them the economic heft to demand better pricing for inputs. Instead of getting a few dozen bags of fertilizer and the odd hoe and such from the local store, large farms would contract directly with petrochemical firms and manufacturers for their needs. The very rationale for small towns eroded. Globalization didn't simply empty the countryside, it also gutted the world's smaller communities, forcing everyone into the major cities. And as true as this was in Nebraska or New South Wales, it was wildly more true in places like the Brazilian Cerrado or Russia's Black Earth region or China's Rice Belt. Every change results in the same change. More food grown and more food distributed, but done so with less labor. The initial phases of the Industrial Revolution may have pulled people off the farms by providing industrial employment. And the development of synthetic agricultural inputs may have pushed them into the cities. But the global competition provided by the order hurled farmers off their lands. And even that assumes the rising local agricultural behemoth firms don't muscle smallholders out or that the government doesn't forcibly consolidate small plots into larger, more efficient factory farms. The former is more common in places where centralized control is weak, such as Argentina, Brazil, and Ukraine, while the latter is the norm in countries with a reputation for national development plans, such as India, China, and South Africa. Territories that had lacked regional security or sufficient capital since the dawn of recorded history could suddenly tap global flows to become significant producers and even exporters for the first time. Foodstuffs both increased in quality and decreased in cost, 
That put pressure on legacy producers in the developed world, forcing them to either up their game with tech to increase yields, or give up the ghost and instead focus on things they did better. Tastes diversified. For the most part, countries gave up attempting to grow foods they couldn't grow well, drastically increasing their output for the crops they could grow well. The Americans' prohibition of military conflict among their allies eliminated the heartburn of worrying where one might get their next meal. Global agricultural trade exploded, and the need for national and imperial autarky went out the window. Americans' transformation of the global security and economic architecture, or more accurately, the Americans' creation of the world's first truly global security and economic architecture, enabled the industrialization and urbanization experiences that had defined Europe for the previous quarter millennia to go global. The first wave of globalization impacted the early incarnations of the Order Alliance, Western Europe, the defeated Axis, the ward states of South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore, and the other Anglo-settler states, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. Technically, many Western Hemispheric nations were also part of the first round of the order, as they were Bretton Woods signatories. But most of them chose to embrace the security aspect of the system, no empires, without meaningfully participating in the economic aspects. As with the British and Germans before them, the peoples of all these nations experienced mass development, mass urbanization, mass reductions in mortality, mass extensions of lifespans, mass expansions in population, and mass reductions in birth rates in that order. In fact, nearly all the population gains in the developed world since 1965, overall a greater than 50% increase, are from longer lifespans. And just as the Germans had followed the British path and so experienced a faster, more compressed version of the entire demographic transition, so too did the first big batch of post-World War II states. The path had gotten easier to follow. Water, not electricity, powered the first factories. There were as many limitations on where they could be built as there were on the cities of ancient times, which similarly limited the need for workers to staff them. The rise of interchangeable parts and assembly lines predated electricity. Such early industrial efforts may have surpassed the output of previous manufacturing norms by an order of magnitude, but they still required either wind, water, or muscle to energize them. That limited the speed and scope and location of their adoption to very specific geographies of success, retarding the urbanization impact. But by 1945, the Germans had demonstrated that electricity was the only way to go. Suddenly a factory could be put anywhere. History sped up. The British may have blazed the path to development, but it was the Germans who paved it for the rest of us. Instead of the seven generations it took to transform Britain, or the four for Germany, the Canadians, Japanese, Koreans, Italians, and Argentines did it in two and a half, while a group of advanced nation latecomers, Spain, Portugal, and Greece, did it in two. Nor did the story end there. After the Cold War's end, the Americans threw open order membership to the former neutrals, as well as the former Soviet world. The result was the same assault of capital access, resource access, and technological access that generated the European and Japanese booms of the 1950s and 1960s, but across a much wider swath of the world and a much larger slice of humanity. Now, the vast bulk of the developing world could join in the industrializing, urbanizing, demographics changing fun, with the largest new players being China. India, Indonesia, Pakistan, Brazil, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Russia, Mexico, Philippines, Vietnam, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Turkey. Just as the addition of electricity to the industrial toolkit sped up the process, so did the digital revolution. With information no longer locked within individual brains, but instead flowing freely on a river of electrons, expertise could be shared with the click of a button. Prototyping sped up from a years-long process to mere weeks. What was known could be disseminated within seconds, while research collaboration could cross continents and oceans alike. 
Just as the Germans were able to walk down the path faster than the British, and just as the Japanese were able to jog down the path faster than the Germans, and just as the Spanish were able to run down the path faster than the Japanese, now the more advanced nations of the developing world, specifically the Chinese, Brazilians, and Vietnamese, could sprint down that same road faster than the Spanish. And yet, despite all the wildly unplanned changes, somehow it all not simply worked, but worked beautifully. What was truly spectacular, even magical, about the post-Cold War moment wasn't simply that war and famine had largely vanished from the world, but instead that all these countries' populations, aging and expanding at different rates, created the perfect foundation for breakneck, historically unprecedented economic growth. Between roughly 1980 and 2015, all the world's internationally wired systems fell into one of two broad buckets. In bucket number one were those countries relatively early in their demographic transitions. Mortality was rapidly falling and lifespans were rapidly expanding, but the drop in birth rates had not yet led to catastrophic reductions in the number of young workers. These countries were ravenous and not just for food. Most of the spending a person does occurs between the ages of 15 and 45. That's the life window when people are buying cars and homes and raising children and seeking higher education. Such consumption-led activity is what drives an economy forward, and this bucket of countries had consumption to spare. The countries in bucket number two were further along. Mortality was still falling, and lifespans were still expanding, but the pace had slowed. After all, these countries had generally begun their industrialization a few decades earlier. But the drops in their birth rates had also begun earlier, and the dearth of children in their demographic profiles was becoming obvious. Priorities changed. Fewer children meant fewer resources needed to be expended upon child-rearing and education, while more could be splashed out on cars and condos. Older populations had accrued more capital, enabling more money to be saved and invested. These aging societies did not become less dynamic, but instead more so, because they were able to develop and implement technologies at a more rapid pace. Productivity surged while the products produced became more sophisticated. What these countries lacked was enough young people to consume what they produced. In this, the Americans accidentally provided the solution. Not only was a central tenet of the order that the American market would be open to all, but also the Americans' security commitment to holding up the world's collective civilizational ceiling meant that these older demographics, these export-led economies, could access consumer markets the world over. Consumption-led and export-led systems were not simply in approximate balance. The Americans seeing to the world's security concerns enabled a truly globalized world to not only emerge, but thrive. But there is nothing about it that was normal. Globalization was always dependent upon the Americans' commitment to the global order, and that order hasn't served Americans' strategic interests since the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. Without the Americans riding herd on everyone, it is only a matter of time before something in East Asia or the Middle East or the Russian periphery, like, I don't know, say a war, breaks the global system beyond repair, assuming that the Americans don't do it themselves. But even if the Americans choose to continue holding up the world's collective civilizational ceiling, there is nothing about the heyday of globalization that is sustainable. The halcyon days of 1980 to 2015 are over. The collapse in birth rates that began across the developed world in the 1960s and across the developing world in the 1990s now has decades of steam behind it. The pipe bomb in the ointment is that what proved true for accelerated industrialization proved equally true for accelerated demographics. In 1700, the average British woman bore 4.6 children. That's almost identical to that of the average German woman in 1800, or the average Italian woman in 1900, or the average Korean woman in 1960, or the average Chinese woman in the early 1970s. 
Now, in all these countries, the new average is below 1.8, and in many cases, well below. As of early 2022, the most recent data out of Korea and China indicate the new normal is 1.2. This is a position the average Bangladeshi woman will likely find herself in by 2030. Now comes the other side of the hill. A central factor in every growth story that accompanies industrialization is that much of the economic growth comes from a swelling population. What most people miss is that there's another step in the industrialization come urbanization process. Lower mortality increases the population to such a degree that it overwhelms any impact from a decline in birth rates, but only for a few decades. Eventually, gains in longevity max out, leaving a country a greater population, but with few children. Yesterday's few children leads to today's few young workers, leads to tomorrow's few mature workers. And now, at long last, tomorrow has arrived. In the 2020s, birth rates are no longer simply dropping. They have been so low for so long that even the countries with the younger age structures are now running low on young adults, the demographic that produces the children. As the already smaller 20-something and 30-something cadres age into their 30s and 40s, birth rates will not simply continue their long decline, they will collapse. And once a country has more older folks than children, the next horrible step is utterly unavoidable. A population crash. And because any country that begins this process is one that has already run out of young adults, these countries will never recover. Barring a breakthrough in low-cost mass cloning technologies. Even worse, just as the entire transformation from rural to urban has proceeded ever faster since the British started us all down this road, so too does the demographic transformation from lots of children to lots of retirees. The faster the transformation and growth on the front end, the faster the population collapse on the back end. By far the most unfortunate tsunami of consequence of this compression phenomenon at work is China. The long stretch of Chinese history was comparatively pre-industrial until one Richard Milhouse Nixon's 1972 visit to one Mao Zedong in what would prove a successful effort to turn red China against the Soviet Union. The price for Chinese realignment was pretty straightforward, admittance into the American-led global order. Some 800 million Chinese started down the route to industrialization, a route that was now less a newly blazed path and more a 14-lane superhighway with double HOV lanes. Following the patterns established by much of the rest of humanity, Chinese mortality plummeted by three quarters and the Chinese population expanded to match. China, like everyone else, saw its population surge from under 800 million in 1970 to over 1.4 billion in 2021. If some of these data and timelines seem a bit squishy, it's because they are. Geographically, China is remarkably complex, generating a similarly complex and disunited political history. Between geographic variety and political scramble, there is no singular Chinese development path. Places like Shanghai had started industrializing unevenly as early as 1900 while most of northern China didn't even begin experimenting with the general process until the disasters of the Great Leap Forward of 1958-62. to The result in population growth was similarly uneven. Some of the coastal regions experienced the boom far earlier than others. Overall, between 1950 and 1970, China's population expanded from 540 million to 810 million-ish. Countering that, the Great Leap Forward generated one of humanity's greatest man-made famines, resulting in between 15 million and 55 million deaths, depending on who is writing the history. So was China fully unindustrialized when Nixon visited? No. 
China at that time was already responsible for 5% of global carbon emissions. But China is still huge. So even those emissions came from a very small percentage of the population living in the most advanced coastal and southern cities. What many in the world see as a threat, the rapid rise of China in economic, military, and demographic terms, is nothing more than 200 years of economic and demographic transformation squeezed into a searing four decades, utterly transforming Chinese society and global patterns of trade, as well as the Chinese demography. No matter how you crunch the numbers, China in 2022 is the fastest aging society in human history. In China, the population growth story is over and has been over since China's birth rate slipped below replacement levels in the 1990s. A full replacement birth rate is 2.1 children per woman. As of early 2022, China's only partly released 2011 to 2020 census indicates China's rate is at most 1.3, among the lowest of any people throughout human history. The country's demographic contraction is now occurring just as quickly as its expansion, with complete demographic collapse certain to occur within a single generation. China is amazing, just not for the reasons most opine. The country will soon have traveled from pre-industrial levels of wealth and health to post-industrial demographic collapse in a single human lifetime, with a few years to spare. Nor will China die alone. The time-staggered nature of the industrialization process, from Britain to Germany to Russia and Northwestern Europe and Japan to Korea to Canada and Spain, means that much of the world's population faces mass retirements, followed by population crashes at roughly the same time. The world's demographic structure passed the point of no return 20 to 40 years ago. The 2020s are the decade when it all breaks apart. For countries as varied as China, Russia, Japan, Germany, Italy, South Korea, Ukraine, Canada, Malaysia, Taiwan, Romania, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Austria, the question isn't when these countries will age into demographic obsolescence. All will see their worker cadres pass into mass retirement in the 2020s. None have sufficient young people to even pretend to regenerate their populations. All suffer from terminal demographics. The real questions are how and how soon do their societies crack apart? And do they deflate in silence or lash out against the dying of the light? Coming up behind them rapidly is another cadre of countries whose birth rates have dropped even faster and so who will face a similar demographic disintegration in the 2030s and 2040s. Brazil, Spain, Thailand, Poland, Australia, Cuba, Greece, Portugal, Hungary, and Switzerland. Even further forward, in the 2050s, are countries who started their birth rate collapse a bit later, and so who may have a chance to avoid demographic dissolution if they can get today's 20 and 30-somethings to have a whole mess of kids. But honestly, these late arrivals birth rate collapses have been so severe it doesn't look great. Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Vietnam, Iran, Turkey, Morocco, Uzbekistan, Saudi Arabia, Chile, the Czech Republic. The next batch of countries, mostly in the poorer parts of Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa or the Middle East, are even more concerning. Their demographic structures are younger, far younger, but that doesn't mean they are in a better position because there is more to economic and demographic health than just numbers and ages. In most cases, these countries are extractive economies that ship out this or that raw commodity, using the proceeds to supply their population with imported food and or consumer goods. 
In many ways, they've managed to access portions of the industrialization process, most notably lower mortality, more reliable food supplies, increased urbanization, and population booms, without experiencing the bits that make advancement stick. Increased educational levels, a modernized state, a value-added economic system, social progress, industrial development, or technological achievement. In a safe, globalized world, such a hybridization model can limp along so long as the commodities flow out and the money flows in. But in an unsafe, fractured world where trade is sharply circumscribed, outright national collapse will by far not be the biggest problem these peoples face. In these countries, the very population is vulnerable to changes farther abroad. The industrial technologies that reduce mortality and raise standards of living cannot be uninvented, but if trade collapses, these technologies can be denied. Should anything impact these countries' commodity outflows or the income or product inflows, the entire place will break down while experiencing deep-rooted famine on a biblical scale. Economic development, quality of life, longevity, health, and demographic expansion are all subject to the whims of globalization. Or rather, in this case, de-globalization. <laughs>